Hi everyone, my name is Wei Yu, and I am the China is not our enemy campaign coordinator at Code Pink. I am joined by Kenneth Hammond, professor at New Mexico State University, author of From Yao to Mao, and co-founder of Pivot to Peace, and Julie Tang, retired judge of the San Francisco Superior Court, and co-founder of the Comfort Women Justice Coalition and Pivot to Peace. Thank you for joining us, Ken and Julie. Thank you. Glad to be here. Today is the Qingming Festival, a traditional Chinese holiday for commemorating and paying respect to ancestors. Timed with the Qingming Festival, former Taiwan President Ma Yingjiu has embarked on a historic trip to mainland China. This trip makes Ma the first former or current Taiwan president to visit the mainland. Against the political backdrop of heightened tension in the Taiwan Strait, Ma's visit is highly personal. During the 12-day trip, Ma and his sisters trace their family roots to a village in Hunan province and pay tribute to their grandparents who were buried there. Ma also brought 30 young people from Taiwan to engage with university students in mainland China. Ma's visit coincides with current Taiwan president Tsai ing visit to Central America with two quote-unquote transits in the United States bookending the trip. Taiwan and the U.S. don't have formal diplomatic relations, so Tsai's transits are not official state visits. The White House has not been participating publicly, and Tsai met with a few politicians informally. And very lately, just this Monday, there was an announcement that there will be a meeting with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and some other officials. It was almost a hush-hush visit, and we'll talk more about that. I want to start with a question for Ken. Ma's visit to mainland China is timed with the Qingming Festival. Could you tell us more about the cultural significance of this holiday? Sure. The Qingming Festival is is a very, very ancient um, moment. Uh, it's a very, very ancient mark in the, in the Chinese annual calendar that is dedicated to the commemoration of one's ancestors. Uh, Qingming, it means pure and bright. Uh, comes at this time at the beginning of April, uh, you know, as the as the year is is warming up and the sun is coming out more, uh, and so it's a it's a moment of of both commemoration, uh, but also in a sense of of looking forward, connecting to the past, connecting to one's ancestors, uh, but also celebrating. Uh, people go out to to the tombs of their ancestors. Uh, you clean up. You maybe have a, a uh, a little ritual there of expressing your respect for the ancestors. And often then families will gather, have a have a meal, nice meal, uh, make a little sort of have a have a place at the table in a sense, uh, for the presence of the spirits of the ancestors. It's a as I say, it's a very it's a very deep traditional um, um, ritual in Chinese culture. And I think that uh, it's important that Ma Yingzhou is making this uh, uh, visit, making this journey to uh, connect with his ancestors on the mainland. Uh, this is a time; it's a it's a it's a marker of the 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 unity uh, of the people on both sides of the Straits of Taiwan. That these are Chinese people; they share a culture, they share language. They share rituals and traditions. They share an identity, uh, a consciousness of who they are and, and of their being. And I think that that in this context, the, the present sort of moment, where there's been so much uh, uh, stirring up of uh, possible uh, divisions, or at least attempts to to foment uh, divisions between people on Taiwan and people on the mainland, that Ma Ying Zhou's uh, efforts here. You can see uh, in, in the video uh, taking part in these ritual activities. Uh, this is a gesture of, of community. It's a gesture of solidarity. It's a gesture of continuity uh, because this is a, it's a single culture. There's plenty of diversity, of course, uh, within China, different regions, different cuisines, and different dialects. We all know that China is not some sort of monolithic entity. But there are certain commonalities and certain continuities within Chinese civilization, within Chinese culture, within the lives of, of ordinary Chinese people that unite them, that, that allow Chinese people to recognize each other and recognize the, the bonds of, of, of unity which hold them together. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a 
wonderful gesture. It's a gesture that that suggests that uh, you know <laughs> some things go deeper than the than the news cycle or the latest attempt to grab a headline or score a political point, and that uh, uh, this is the kind of of this is the kind of joining together. This is the kind of unified vision of a future, a future shared by people on both sides of the strait that I think we all hope for. Certainly those of us working with Pivot to Peace or Code Pink, uh, we're very much dedicated to this. And I think that Mai Ying-Jo uh, really deserves, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of praise uh, for taking what has to be a, a somewhat courageous move at this time uh, and stepping up and saying, you know, we are Chinese people. We share our culture. We want to be together. Thank you, Ken. And uh, my next question is for Julie. Um, we mentioned that uh, Tsai is having these two quote-unquote transits in the U.S. How is the American civil society reacting to Tsai's transits? And how is that contrasted with mass reception by the Chinese public? Most Americans don't know or care about what Tsai is doing here. Many don't even know where Taiwan is, let alone its history and relationship with China. Taiwan is part of China. In 1979, the United States signed a joint agreement with China, called it the Shanghai Communicate, that there is but one China and Taiwan is part of China. And any dispute between Taiwan and China shall be resolved between them. Most Americans are not aware of this United States commitment to China. Chai's visit here is insignificant to Americans, but significant to her home audience. She's here to drum up support for her party, the DPP, for Taiwan's 2024 presidential election. And she needs drama and political presence in the United States and proof that the United States has her back. But so far, it has not boded well for her. The White House has shunned her ostensibly due to the non-diplomatic nature of a visit. But we know this concern about China's objections to her visit. In the United States, there are demonstrations trailing her everywhere. She also has a closed door meeting where she got an award from a think tank that is said to have received hundreds of thousands of dollars in grant funding from Taiwan. On the other hand, former President Ma of Taiwan has been having a busy, joyous, and emotional visit in China. He paid honor to his grandfather's graveyard and visited the museums of former war heroes who died fighting the Japanese during World War II. There were very emotional moments in particular when he visited the Memorial Hall of the Victims in Nanjing. He visited historical places that have a shared history with Taiwan and China. He even sang a famous song with the young people from China. Everywhere he was greeted with respect and love and joy, and he was given the honor and prestige of a foreign dignitary. The Chinese public loved him. They called up Mr. Ma, Ma Shanshang, when they saw him. And in some instances, he responded spontaneously and affectionately. These are very different experiences and treatment from what Chai Ying-wen, the current president of Taiwan, has from America, and what Ma ying a former president of Taiwan in, the, in China. Very different. Thank you, Julie. Um, so going back to Ken, what is the role of the United States in the hide tension in the Taiwan Strait? Why is the meeting... Sorry, can I start over with a question? Okay. I, I, there was a typo on my script. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You'd be good. Thank you, Julie. Going back to Ken, what is the role of the United States in the heightened tension in the Taiwan Strait? What is the meaning of her meeting with McCarthy, which the White House has not endorsed or objected to? Well, the role of the United States in, in the situation regarding the, the status of Taiwan is that it is, it is the destabilizing force. Uh, you know, the, the, the position of the, the government in Beijing, the position of the, of the government of the People's Republic, the government of China, uh, has been stated repeatedly over and over again. 
which is that the, the status of Taiwan, the question of the status of Taiwan, is a question that comes down from history. It comes down from the end of the Civil War, the end of the 1940s, uh, when the nationalist uh, movement uh, lost and went to the island of Taiwan. And under the protection of the United States uh, Navy, which interposed itself in the strait at that point between the mainland and the island, um, has been protected by the United States uh, over many, many years. And the United States continues to supply uh, massive amounts of equipment and assistance to Taiwan. So this is a situation that has come down from history. Uh, and it is a situation, according to the, the People's Republic and according to the agreement that uh, the United States has had, public, it is a situation that needs to be resolved by the Chinese people on both sides of the strait in their own way and in their own time without, side, without any outside interference. Uh, it's a situation that isn't going to be resolved by intervention. It isn't going to be resolved by American pressure. It isn't going to be resolved by the United States trying to provoke China in, in one way or another. It's something that needs to be taken care of. And there's no hurry. It's not something which, uh, you know, is, is, is going to change overnight. Uh, it has, there, there've been there's been tremendous progress, especially when Ma Zhou was president. Uh, you know, agreements were reached, meetings were held. 600,000 plus people from Taiwan live on the mainland. Millions and millions of travelers go back and forth across the strait every year. There's massive amounts, billions and billions of dollars of investment uh, across the strait. Uh, you know, China and Taiwan are not, not just sort of theoretically or abstinected, but they are they are integrated with one another economically and very much, as I was just saying about Ma Ying Zhou's trip, very much culturally. You know, the National Palace Museum in Taipei holds the treasures, many of the greatest treasures of Chinese civilization brought by the nationalists back in 1948-49. But that symbolizes the connections, the, the ongoing linkages between the island and the rest of the country. So it's the United States that has been provoking China. It's the United States politicians, not so much with an eye on the actual needs or interests of the people of Taiwan, and certainly not with an eye on the interests of the needs of the people of China, but also not even with an eye on the needs of the people of the United States, our people. Uh, you know, it's the American politicians trying to score political points, trying to trying to ratchet up their, their electoral, you know, ratings or something, grab 30 seconds of a, of a soundbite. Um, and they're being very reckless and very dangerous. So I think that, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, about no war with China, no war over Taiwan, stop the military aid, things like that, what we're trying to do is is calm things down, get American political leaders to get back in touch with the real world. And and let's let's go forward and try to make the best of a situation which can be beneficial for for all people on both sides of the strait and for the American people and not be reckless, provocative. Uh, trying to trying to spark conflict where no one will benefit and where the Chinese people, all of them, both sides of the strait, are perfectly capable of pursuing their own interests and resolving their own issues. Thank you, Ken. And I really appreciate you bringing up um, the role of the people here because my final question for Julie, uh, what should be the takeaway from these two visits for the public and for peace activists? I echo a lot of what Professor Hammond said. I think the most important aspect of this trip for Mr. Ma, the former president of Taiwan, is that he showed a peaceful reunification between Taiwan and China should be the goal and is entirely possible. He showed the Taiwan people that they shared a common root that goes back centuries, that they are brothers and sisters across the street. They don't need to go to war to resolve their differences. Now, both actually both Ma and Chai's visits made it very clear what it would be like in the 2024 Taiwan election. Chai's handpicked candidate will follow the war path, continuing to pursue a separatist movement and stoke a war with China under US hegemon. But Ma's peace mission, the former president's mission, showed that there is an option 
for the Taiwan electorates. He showed them what a future would be like under reunification, and there's a model in which China and Taiwan could resolve differences on their own. Taiwan people should not be used as a proxy to fight the U.S. war. And this is where Chai is making a big mistake. Judging from the way that she has been treated in the United States, she doesn't have much leverage over the United States. Our country will use her and be done with her just as fast when we don't need her. But China will always open her arms to welcome Taiwan back into its motherland. Remember Kissinger once said, to be an enemy of the United States is dangerous. To be our friend is fatal. Former President Ma's visit to China and Chai's visit to the United States is indeed a learning moment for the people of Taiwan and for the world. Thank you so much, Julie and Ken, for all your insight today. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Wei, for hosting this program. And thank you to everyone for watching this. This is a co-production for Pivot to Peace and Code Pink.